All right, so I am now recording the lecture and we're gonna start with an overview of the course. So I'm just gonna pull up the course outline and then we will uh, work our way through from there. Um, oh, and I need this other thing too, actually. And I need this thing on the jigger. Okay, sweet. Okay, so today what we're going to do is basically just get started with the lecture. Um, if you, I, I recognize a few of the names in the chat and I recognize some of the names on the course list. Uh, so I think that there are students in this class that have taken STAT 151 with me. Um, and in some cases, they might have actually taken, taken the course with me last semester. And if that's the case, and this is going to be very familiar to you because the way that I teach STAT 252 and the way that I teach STAT 151 um, is the same. Now, for those of you who haven't taken a class with me before, my name is Brian Franzak, and I have been teaching at McEwen for five or six years now. Um, I always have to, the, the fact that I have to count is, uh, is showing that I'm starting to get up there. But um, I've been teaching here for a while. I've taught STAT 5.2 a number of times. I've taught STAT 1.5.1 a number of times. So the material in this course is, is pretty familiar. Um, and I think because of that, it should be pretty smooth sailing through the semester. I am going to be making some changes to the course material this semester. So I won't be posting it all right up front like I did in previous semesters, but I'll still have the lecture sets out well before we start uh, each each set. Okay, so a few bookkeeping items. Uh, one, of course, this is STAT 252, as I had mentioned before. So if you're not in STAT 252, you're probably in the wrong room, but I don't know how that would have happened given that we're still online. Um, to clarify, <clears throat> actually, I'll get to that in a second. So the first uh, bookkeeping item, we're going to use Blackboard for the semester. So all of the course materials, the announcements, practice problems, formula sheets, assignments, um, any course item and course detail will be posted on Blackboard. So you can access that through learn.mcewen.ca. And I imagine at this point that you guys all have experience with Blackboard, but if you don't, um, please let me know and we can go over that. Um, during office hours, for example, or I can just kind of walk you through it via email, something like this. Um, in terms of office hours, I'm going to have two office hours a week. So right now, those are scheduled on Wednesday and Friday from 10 to 11 a.m. And in the event that we are back on campus, I'll hold them in my office. Otherwise, I will hold them on Zoom. And the link to the office hour room is given in the course outline. And it's also given in the course content folder. And I'll send weekly update or weekly reminders of the office hour times with the link. So there should always be, you should always be able to access the link easily. And if you need to meet with me outside of office hours, you can just send me an email and let me know um, what it is that you need to meet about. And we can schedule a time to go over the course material, for example. Okay, so the lecture. <laughs> so the lecture um, structure is ever changing as we deal with the new variants and whatnot. Originally, this class was um, scheduled to be a hybrid class. So in PeopleSoft, what it might look like is it'll say a lecture time and then it'll say the room on campus. And then below that, there will be another row and there's a box that says online asynchronous. So that is supposed to represent hybrid. Now, the way that the hybrid classes are supposed to work is we have a significant portion in person and a significant portion online. So the plan in order to adhere to this was to have a lecture every two weeks online. That was the idea. 
right? So I have here lecture structure. The majority of classes are expected to be face-to-face. -face. Every two weeks, a Thursday lecture will be held online starting on Thursday, January 20th. Okay, so that was the plan. But obviously this is not gonna be the case um, for at least the first three weeks because we are going to be strictly online until January 21st. So that being said, the significant online portion of the class is gonna get covered in the first few weeks of the semester. And then after that, the plan will be to go back to the original face-to-face -face, um, lecture style. And we will kind of just push forward from there. Now, clearly this is all kind of up in the air right now. We're gonna be online until January 21st. I would imagine we're probably going to be online past January 21st, but I could be pleasantly surprised and maybe we'll be back in person in the fourth week of the semester. But at this point, you can probably just assume that we're going to be having most of the lectures online. And unfortunately, as a result, we're going to have to do the tests online as well. But we'll just have to wait and see how that um, how that kind of plays out. But Throughout the semester, we're gonna use this same Zoom link for all of the lectures. And again, I'll send reminders the day before the lectures with the Zoom link. The Zoom link is also in the course outline and it's also going to be in the course content folder of the Blackboard page. Okay, um, STAT 252 is the next um, intro, statistic, intro statistics course that we offer. So the prereq is STAT 151 or STAT 161. So we're assuming that you have effectively the, um, you, we assume that you have a knowledge of the majority of the concepts that we are going to talk about in this class. And we're gonna take those to the next level and start to look at them in more depth is essentially the purpose. Okay. So in the course outline, you can also find a course description. You can find the course objectives. Um, if you're interested in those, but as we progress through the semester, the objectives and the materials that we're going to cover will be obviously become very clear to you. This is a pretty traditional course. Um, so we have three lecture quizzes. Those dates are given on page three of the course outline. So right under due dates for the assignment, we have examination dates, quiz one, quiz two, quiz three. So we have three quizzes that take place over the course of about six weeks, kind of in the middle part of the semester. Um, and the material for those quizzes will be decided based off of where we are in the lecture set. So basically a week before each quiz, I'll let you know what your, the quiz is gonna be on. And um, then you will write the quiz during class time on the date given in the course outline. The quizzes are gonna be short like 30 minute quizzes. So we're going to have lecture and quiz in the same time slot. Um, and in total, the quizzes are worth 30% of the overall grade. So that would mean that each quiz is about 10 is 10% of the final grade. We're also going to have a final exam. Uh, that's at 20, that's worth 25% of your final grade. The final exam date has not yet been determined. But once we have the final exam date, I will add it to the course outline and I'll send an announcement with the date. It'll also appear in your student system. So this will be held during the final exam period, which is in the middle of April. So from April 7th until the 18th, I think, something like this. We're going to have uh, six lecture assignments and they're worth 20% of the grade. The lecture assignments the due dates rather of the lecture assignments are given in the table on page three. You can see that the first assignment is due um, next Friday and it has already been posted. It's a very short assignment. It's only 29 marks. There's no, um, there aren't any mathematical questions on it. It's, it's sort of a, um, you know, kind of like a welcome back to statistics uh, review of concepts assignment. So you can actually complete the entire assignment at this point, it's all review from STAT 151. The last question is a thought experiment. So it's essentially testing your analytical reasoning or your logic, um, your logical thinking. We will review some of the concepts from 
the assignment in the first lecture set. So we will see some of those concepts today. And I'll go over the first assignment with you before we start the lecture set, just so everyone's kind of fresh on the questions. But again, it's very short. It's due next and it's due next Friday. And um, that's one out of six going to be done right away. Again, the assignments are worth uh, 20 percent, six of them total. And then in alternating weeks, you have your lab assignments, which will be handled by your lab instructors. So there are two lab, instruct lab instructors for STAT 252. They're John Fedoric and um, Jeshuan, uh, Jeshuan Jane, Z Zhang. Sorry about that. <laughs> I should be able to pronounce that by now. Um, so the lecture the labs do not correspond directly with the lecture so if you're in my lecture that doesn't mean that you're all going to be in the same lab you're someone in this lecture can have john and the other person could have just just Wayne. okay so they will handle the administration of the lab assignments so i think um john has actually written up the lab assignments and they'll start to they'll they'll fill you in on what the expectations are for the lab assignments in the lab portion of the course so I'm handling strictly, strictly the lecture portion and they're handling the lab portion. Um, the labs run just slightly behind the lectures. So the plan is that all the material you see in lab, you will have already seen um, in lecture before you get to the lab. And it's worth mentioning that the lab uses SPSS. So last semester, if you took STAT 151 in the past, you would have used either R or um, mini tab. And in STAT 252, we use SPSS. So either way, regardless of your previous STAT 151 course, it's gonna be a, a different software. Okay. And then you can see here that the lab assignments are worth 15% of your final mark and the lab final exam is worth 10% of your mark. All right, now, there is an additional assessment that is strictly bonus so we have or uh karen who runs the other stat 52 section developed these mini projects for stat 252 so there are four mini projects they are not by any means an exhaustive exercise they are very um they're just quick tests of your understanding and the rationale for including these is twofold. One, it gives you the opportunity to earn an extra mark towards your final uh, grade. So each project gives you the ability to um, increase your final mark by 1%. So you could think of it as one bonus percent per assignment. So again, if you don't do any of the group projects, that doesn't matter. You could still get 100% in the course. These are strictly bonus. The grading for the assignment for the group projects is on a scale of zero to two. So zero would mean that you didn't understand the question and you didn't complete it appropriately. One would indicate you're sort of halfway there. And as a result, if you score a one, you get half a percent. And two would indicate that you have um, demonstrated that you understand the assessment and you have returned a um, reasonable answer and if you score a two you get the additional percent now these uh this project is actually a group project so the way that this is going to work is if you are interested in participating you have to email me by monday and let me know that you want to take part in the group project once i have the list of all students that are interested in taking part in the group project I will send an email to you and your teammates. So I am going to select the groups and the groups are going to change for every single mini project, okay? Now, <clears throat> when you email me to let me know that you're interested, I am going to assume that you will be interested for the entire semester. If at any point you don't want to participate anymore, you just have to email me and say, I don't want to do this anymore. And that's the end of it. Again, there's no marks lost. It's strictly bonus. At the start, 
of each three week period, I will release the question for the mini project. So basically, I would like everyone to email me my email me by Monday and let me know that they like if they'd like to participate. And then on Tuesday, or hopefully on Monday, if I get everything early enough, I'll send out the question to you and your teammates. And then you have until the end of week three to submit your project. You can see that the report for the mini project is very simplistic. It's just basically a write up with the name of the people in your team, when you met, and you're asked only to include the people that are actually contributing. So if you are sent an email with two teammates and there's only two of you that actually do the work on the project, you don't need to include the third person on said project. Okay. And then you just give the results based off of the question that is that has been assigned. Right. So the project, the mini project is due at the end of every third week. So the dates are given in this little handout here. Then the next project will be sent at the start of the following week. So the only exception is the first one because we have to get it set up. But it's again, they're not taxing projects. You're not going to be spending lots of time doing these. They're pretty, they're they're quite straightforward uh, in what they're asking. All right. So um, if interested in participating in this, please send me an email by Monday at the latest. The sooner you do this, the better, because the sooner you do it, the sooner I can put start putting teams together and then sending out uh, the questions to each individual team. Um, and again, this is completely for bonus. So if you're not interested, that's perfectly fine. It's not going to hurt your mark in any way. And if you are interested, it is a good way to meet some of your classmates and to have a little bit of interaction, especially when we're online and we don't have that traditional face-to-face um, -face collaboration. Okay, uh, does anyone have any questions about the assessment aspects of the course? So we talked about this bonus mini project, and then we talked about the quizzes, exam, and the assignments. Oh, good question. Um, all of the assignments will be submitted using uh, Crowdmark. So um, I've posted the Crowdmark assignment in the course content section of Blackboard, and I will release it at the end of today. Um, so that's the answer via Crowdmark. If you haven't used Crowdmark before, um, it's very straightforward. Effectively, you're just uploading photos of your uh, question answers into this um, online system, and then we mark the pages directly. But if you have any questions about it or you aren't sure, again, just send me an email and we can go over it. But most students are able to pick it up pretty quickly. Any other questions? <sighs> Any other questions? Did I say any other question? <laughs> any other question? One more. Okay, I'm not seeing any. So I'll just, for the purpose of time, I'll keep moving through here. Okay, uh, the course outline also contains a lot of other material about how the course is going to be run. So very, for example, we have the grading scheme. Uh, this is consistent across every course. So I'm sure you're familiar with this. Um, we ask that students don't make any recordings or post um, any recordings of the material online. That being said, I'm going to post this lecture, these lectures that are recorded online on YouTube. Um, anyways, at least for the first three weeks. And any changes to structure will be announced as we move through. Uh, then we have the responsibilities and expectations section. So please review this, but again, consistent across all courses. And then on the last page, we have an overview of the topics that we're gonna talk about in this class. So you can see that actually there's quite a bit of review that's caked into STAT 252. So the first three weeks is basically review of STAT 151. And in particular, we focus on the inferential part of the course. In week four, we talk about the ANOVA, which uh, some of you might've seen before. If you took STAT 151 with me last semester, you would have seen this kind of very broadly, but 
week four is effectively when we get into the um, the new material. And even though some of you will have seen ANOVA before, we're going to talk about it in, in a much greater detail than we did in STAT 151. So there will be some review aspects, but for the most part, it will be new material. So again, we're going to start off with about three weeks of review, and then we're going to get into the, the newer the newer items. Um, and um, all of the chapter references that are given in the course outline are with respect to the same textbook that was used for STAT 151. So that's the uh, introductory statistics book by Weiss. That being said, you don't need a textbook for this class. Um, there are no required materials. The lab manual is online and is a, it will be is free and will be given to you in lab and all of the um, items from the course outline will be covered in the lecture sets. So those are, again will also be provided to you and those are what we'll work through during class. All right, so um, let's turn our attention to the first lecture set so that we can hopefully get through that today. And um, let's also just take a quick look at assignment one so that we have uh, some idea of what we're looking for here. Okay, so this is the first assignment due January 14th, as I mentioned before. So again, very short assignment. It's only 29 marks, nine questions. One of the questions is multiple choice. We have a two mark multiple choice question. <laughs> All right, so first question, what is the purpose of inferential statistics? So I, this is basically just a definition question asking you to explain what inferential statistics is and why we use it. The second question is asking you to differentiate between a parameter, an estimator, and an estimate and provide an example to illustrate the difference between each of them. The third example um, has to do with sampling error. So basically it's asking you why we would expect an error to be present when we um, conduct inferential statistics, for example. The fourth question is about the p-value. So basically just asking you to explain the logic behind how we use a p-value. For the fourth question, this will likely require you to review your previous notes from STAT 151. We will talk about the p-value in lecture set three uh, when we review hypothesis testing, but we most likely will not get to lecture set three before next Friday. So some of this, this assignment, as I mentioned before, is um, review of previous material. And this is one of the questions that you might need to look back on some old notes for just to go over the rationale. Uh, question five, what is basically, what is the main result from the CLT? Um, this should be very familiar if you have taken 151 recently. And if not, again, you'll need to uh, go back and look at some old notes. But I will talk about the central limit theorem in lecture set one. Um, what does it mean for a population to be normally distributed? This is, and again, asking for an example to explain what this means. So you can see that the questions on this assignment are very conceptual, nothing mathematical, really testing your understanding of key concepts from our previous uh, course in statistics. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. So the question is, uh, can we type out answers and screenshot? Yeah. That's it's perfectly fine. Um, if you use Word, another option is you can type your answers in Word and then you can export the PDF and you can just upload the PDF on the CrowdMark directly. That might actually be easier than screenshotting, but either, either method is fine. Um, what does it mean to be 95% confident? In question eight, you're basically just being asked to interpret a 95% confidence interval. This is a multiple choice question. And then question nine, as I had mentioned before, is kind of this uh, test of logic slash analytical reasoning. So you're given two contingency tables. You're being asked to verify the percentages that are given above. So basically just show where 78%, 83%, 87%, sorry, just show where the percentages in points one, two, and three came from using these contingency tables. And then after that, 
you're actually being asked to use the tables to make a conclusion or to make a suggestion about what you think of these two treatments when it comes to treating the kidney stones. Okay, so that this is a broad overview of the first assignment, but again, this is something you can get started on right away and you could have finished by the end of the week if you're if you have the time. This is all again review uh, from our previous stat courses and then this um, logic question that's given at the end. All right, so we're getting into it right away, which is probably the best way to do it, to be honest. Um, having stuff to work on through the semester keeps students more engaged. It's just the reality of the situation. And um, we, uh, we're wasting no time. <laughs> Any questions before I turn to the lecture set? I'm not seeing any. So again, um, I will throughout the semester, I'll send lots of announcements. So please uh, pay attention to your email or check the announcement page on Blackboard regularly. Um, reminders about lectures, office hours, quizzes, um, all those sorts of things will be provided to you as we progress through the semester. Um, assignment due dates, please make a note of these. The course outline contains them, but um, Crowdmark will also remind you of when the well will also give you the assignment due date in the system. And um, outside of that, we're just going to start working through the material um, for the class. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with lecture set number one. Seems like a pretty logical place to start, I think. Uh, and this uh, lecture set is focused on general terminology that we utilize in statistics and sampling distributions. In reference to STAT 151, we're basically starting at the halfway point of the course. So we're sort of starting at central limit theorem and then working our way forward. All right, so in this lecture set, we're gonna have a few quick, um, we're gonna review some of the basic concepts from um, our earlier introductory course. So we're going to talk about the definition of statistics, types of statistics. We'll review population versus sample and the measurements that are associated with each of those. And then we will talk about sampling distributions, the, how sampling distributions behave when we have normally distributed populations and how sampling distributions behave when we do not have normally distributed populations. Okay. All right. So here's my um, pirated quote that I use at the start of pretty much every statistics course that I teach. So a quote by uh, W. A. Wallace that gives a, a general definition of statistics, and it call and it says that when referring to statistics, we can think of it as a body of methods for making wise decisions in the face of uncertainty. All right. Now, more strictly. We can think of statistics in two ways. We can think of statistics as being facts or data, um, and these can be numerical or non-numerical, non-numerical, and they can be used to organize or summarize information about a particular body of um, observations. So about a particular population, for example. This is probably the most common um definition of statistics and this is probably the way that we see statistics most often kind of in the real world as just raw facts you know i mean there's lots of very there's lots of different examples of this um that you could point to i mean maybe the most relevant example would just be case counts um i'm not sure how many of you pay attention to this i think at this point most people are pretty tired of the whole thing so it's hard to like stay really focused but that would be just you know kind of as a relevant example a, an, an illustration of a different statistics and a, a different statistic which is just counts and you know they can be very basic in that they're literally just telling you how many people you know have tested positive on a given day of the week 
The second definition of statistics um, is in terms of it actually being like a science. So we say that, or we can think of statistics as the science of organizing and summarizing numerical or non-numerical information. And the second definition is what we're gonna focus on in this class. So in this class, what we're really interested in doing is learning how we can make statements about a population quantity using a sample of values. And what this course really is, is a summary of nine, of roughly 11 different techniques that we can apply to a different situation in order to make a statement about a population quantity using a sample. So what we're going to do throughout the class is look at, you know, um, let's say like nine different data structures and how each structure can be modeled in a different way. So what we're trying to do is build up your toolbox of statistical techniques. And one of the reasons why we want to do this is because many of you are going to pursue psychology degrees um, in your time at McEwen. This isn't the only reason, but you know this would be relevant to many of the students in this class. And in those um, degrees, you're going to be interested in analyzing different data in order to make conclusions about uh, certain populations of people, or maybe not people, but of observations. The way that the data is collected and the structure of the data is going to lend itself to a particular statistical method. So what we're trying to do here is give you an idea of the different methods that you can use when you need to analyze these different uh, data structures. Okay, so before we get into the survey of those different types of techniques, we're just going to set the scene by again talking about what it means to actually model a particular population and what it means to set assumptions on a particular population. Following from the previous slide, <clears throat> we can actually say that we have two types of statistics. So we define them as the science and as the facts, basically. So our facts are what we call descriptive statistics. So our descriptive statistics are basically just um, values that summarize the information that we have collected. So they're raw numbers for the most part. Inferential statistics are the tools that we use to make a statement about the population of interest based off of the sample that we are working with. Now, these two types of statistics are not independent of one another. What I mean is our descriptive statistics are actually utilized within our inferential, um, our inferential techniques. In this class, again, our focus is going to be on the inferential aspect. So that's really what we're going to be talking about throughout the semester. But in every single case, there's going to be summary statistics that we need to calculate in order to use the inferential tool that we are working with. But in general, the purpose of inferential statistics is to take a sample of values and make a statement about some larger population. So we need to, in all cases, understand that it's important to clearly specify our population such that we can have a clearly drawn sample from that population of interest. And then what we're going to do is talk about all the ways we can actually use the sample to make a statement about the population. All right. <clears throat> okay, so generally speaking, what is a population? The population is just a collection of elements or observations that we are interested in studying. And the population can be comprised of anything. Um, you know, it could be human beings, it could be animals, it could be cars, um, it could be trees, it could be anything. The sample is simply a set taken from that population. So 
the sample is actually by definition a subset of the population of interest. So the easiest way to think about this is through an illustration. So we have this box here, which we will define as the population. And then inside the box, we have this circle here, which we can think of as a sample, okay? So the sample is literally just taking a portion of the population. And we can have many different samples collected from the same population. In fact, this will be one of the concepts that we talk about throughout the semester, is this idea that most of the inferential tools that we are going to use are based off the idea of repeated sampling. So the idea that we can continue to sample over and over and over again from the same population. And every time we do this, we collect a different sample. And this is one of the reasons why we end up seeing the sampling error, but we'll talk a little bit more about that momentarily. Okay, what are the ideal characteristics of the sample? There's really only one. Um, I mean, obviously, among other things, you would like the sample to be as big as possible because the larger the sample you collect, the more information you have and the more likely it is that your um, conclusion is going to be correct. But the main characteristic that we are looking for when we collect a sample is that it is representative. So if we want to make a statement about a population, we don't want to take a sample that has nothing to do with the population of interest. We want our sample to include all of the characteristics that our population exhibits. Okay, so we basically want our sample to be a snapshot of that population. All right. When we talk about the idea of population versus sample, and we talk about the idea of using the sample to make a statement about the population, in terms of our inferential techniques, this is almost always going to boil down to using a statistic to make a statement about a parameter. So our population is going to be defined by some parameter of interest, okay? Our statistic is gonna be a quantity that we compute from the sample that we took from that population of interest. So when I wanna make a statement about a population using a sample, typically what, we, what I do or what we will learn how to do is construct a question about the corresponding parameter and then use our statistic to make a statement about that parameter. Okay. So really inferential statistics, at least in terms of what we're gonna look at through the semester, boils down to asking questions about particular parameters from the population of interest. Now, on slide eight, I give some general definitions of different parameters and statistics just for reference. So you can see the most, for, for example, the first row shows the mean. So we have the sample mean and the population mean. Effectively, what we're gonna do throughout the semester is when interested in talking about the population mean mu, we're gonna use the sample mean X bar. That's the idea. So for every population parameter, we have some sample statistic that is considered a good estimator of that parameter. And we're gonna use that estimator to make a statement about the parameter of interest. And there's many, many different ways to do this. All right. Okay, so let's look at an example to illustrate this idea. And also to help us understand one of the questions on the first assignment, typically where students get a little confused Okay, um, 
Question one. So we have here uh, a randomly selected sample of final exam scores in a large intro stats class is given as follows. Part A, identify the population of interest. And part B, state the population mean, um, or sorry, part B, estimate the population mean, state the parameter, the estimator, and the estimate. Okay, so we have a sample of final exam scores from a large intro stats class. So the population of interest here is going to be the final exam scores from a large intro statistics class, right? Not much, uh, not much to do or not much to think about there. Pretty, pretty evident based off the problem description. So what we're clearly interested in doing here is studying final exam scores. And we're studying the final exam scores from a large intro stats class because that's where our sample came from, right? Okay, so part B, we wanna estimate the population mean, all right? So we're gonna state the parameter, the estimator, and the estimate. Okay, so the first thing that we'll do is give the parameter. Okay, so the parameter here is gonna be mu, and this is, the population mean final exam score. Okay. So the parameter of interest is the average of all the final exam scores for the entire population. Okay, estimator. All right, so this part, it admittedly is a little bit confusing because of the symbolage that we use in the class. In higher level statistics courses, we differentiate between the estimator and the estimate using a different symbol, but we don't do that here. Um, so the easiest way to explain it is to say that the estimator is basically the um, tool or the formula that we are using to estimate the population mean. Okay, so tool or formula used to estimate mu. Now, in the situation that we estimate a population mean, the most common estimator is the sample mean. Okay, so the from the previous slide. Yeah, sorry, one more try. There we go. This is one over N multiplied by the sum of the XI. Okay, so we can think of this as the estimator. Okay. okay, so we're just thinking of our estimator as being the formula that we're using to estimate the value of interest. Okay, and then our estimates Our estimate 
is going to be the actual value that we obtain from the estimator. So the estimate <coughs> is going to be what we get when we plug our information from the sample into the estimator. Now, the reason it's confusing is because it starts off with the same symbol, right? So we have X bar again, but what we're doing here is we're actually plugging into the formula from above. So we're going to have one over 20 multiplied by 88 plus 67 plus 64 all the way down to the last three values. Okay, and then from this, we're going to get a quantity out, and that quantity is going to be our estimate. And that is going to be equal to a number. So this is going to be 1,550 over 20, which is equal to 77.5. This is our estimate. OK, oh, sorry. And then I guess just for clarity, this would be All right. Any questions? Does that make sense? All right, I'm not seeing any questions. Operating under the assumption everyone is still awake. So on the first assignment, question two is asking about the parameter, the estimator, and the estimate. And it says to provide an example. So in question two, you're stating the difference between each of them and then giving an example to illustrate the difference. Do not use the example that we just went through in class, okay? So this is my example. This cannot also be your example. So you need to come up with a fresh situation. <clears throat> it's also worth pointing out that this, these definitions are not strict to just the mean, right? So, For example, so a second illustration of um, a parameter estimator and estimate. So we can have the same set of definitions for pretty much any parameter that exists in the population, right? So we could also, for example, say that we are interested in estimating sigma squared. So this is the variance of the population variable. Okay, in this case, our estimator is going to be S squared.
Okay, and this is going to be the sum from i equals 1 to n of xi minus x bar squared divided by n minus 1. And then our estimate is going to be the value that we get out for this number, which actually in this case is 17.6064 squared. Okay. And you can verify. Right, but the, the purpose here, <clears throat> is to emphasize the fact that your examples for the first assignment, they don't have to strictly be about the population mean. You could pick any parameter that might be of interest to you. So the variance, standard deviation, median, a proportion, there's a lot of different uh, values that can be used to uh, describe a population. And in every case, you just have to then state a reasonable estimator and then state what the estimate would be based off that estimator, okay? And then, of course, there has to be the situation um, in which you're applying these three definitions. All right. Okay, so now um, that we've established those definitions and we've reviewed kind of this idea of sample versus population, et cetera, um, we're going to turn our attention to the definition of the sampling distribution. Okay. Oh, um, oh, good, I have it, okay. So in order to understand how a sampling distribution works, we first need to do a little bit of review of what it means to be a random variable. So basically a random variable is an observation that belongs to the population of interest, but we haven't actually observed it yet. So in practice, what we typically do is we make an assumption about the shape of the population. Most often what we say, or for most of the techniques that we're gonna study, at least in the first half of the course, but really the most of the techniques that we're gonna study in the entire course, our assumption is that the population is normal. So we might have a random variable that we call capital X. Capital X is a value that comes from the population that we're interested in. And we might say like capital X is normally distributed, All right? So, um, well, so on this slide, I'm then giving some basic definition, or I'm giving uh, some symbolage to represent this definition. So for example, here, where I have x tilde n comma 1560, or bracket 1564, this is just a shorthand notation to indicate that capital X is normal. It has a mean of 15, and it has a standard deviation of 8. But here we have 64 because sigma squared is equal to 64, right? So this is saying normal mu equals 15, sigma squared equals 64. Just some shorthand notation, right? So in this situation, we can also assume that X comes from what is called an infinite population which basically just means that we can sample over and over and over and over and over and over again, an infinite number of times. And every single time we will get a different sample and we'll never run out of values. Somewhat unrealistic assumption based off of different populations that you might be interested in, but the tools that we're utilizing in this class are all based off of this assumption. So 
a lot of the tools that we're going to look at assume normality and then they also assume that you can collect information an infinite number of times our sample is designated as little x so little x represents the sample of values that's taken from capital x which represents the population all right so we can think of again kind of like i just said our sample as being a collection of values from the population right and then here i have how many um, samples of size n can we collect from an infinite population again already talked about this but the point is that we can collect an infinite number of samples okay. so i think that the the most important question right now is what was the purpose of that little background um, description the purpose is to reiterate that <clears throat> if we have a population of interest and we assume that that population of interest is, for example, normal. And we assume that this population is of an infinite size. Then every single time we collect a sample from that population, we have a sample of, or we have a different sample. And that sample can be considered a set of realizations from capital X. So the samples themselves are actually composed of random variables until they are observed. Now, that is important because if we are interested in estimating a population quantity, so for example, if we are interested in estimating mu, every single time we collect a sample, if we acknowledge that those samples are composed of n random variables, then for every sample, if we compute the sample mean, we can think of the sample mean as also being a random variable. So if our population is following some strategic some statistical distribution. So if our population is normally distributed, for example, and then we collect, you know, um, some number of samples from that population. So let's say that we collect 10 samples from the population. And then for each of those 10 samples, we compute a sample mean. Those sample means can also be thought of as a random variable, and they can also be thought of um, as a variable that follows a statistical distribution. And that's really the key part of this little um, description that I'm trying to give. If our population follows a distribution, our sample mean or any of the estimate, any of the estimators that we use for some parameter of interest will also follow some statistical distribution. Now, we talked earlier about the difference between the population and the sample. And we looked at a very basic illustration of a population as a rectangle and then a sample as the circle inside of that rectangle. When we collect a sample from a population, we are only taking a subset of the population. Ideally, that subset is going to be representative. But regardless, it's only a portion of the um, actual population. So by design, we have to acknowledge that there is going to be an error that is associated with that sample or with the result that comes from that sample because we haven't actually taken information from the entire population, okay? This error is what we call sampling error. So the sampling error is a result of using a 
portion of the population, so the sample, to make a statement about the larger population. So basically, the sampling error is a result of us only having a subset of the population to utilize in our statistical analysis. Right. So we're going to be interested in describing this sampling error. And the question now is, why would we be um, interested in doing this? Well, I think that the obvious answer would be so that we can uh, make a reasonable assessment of what we know about that population. So we can make a reasonable assessment of what we um, expect to be true about the population. Or so we can count for the sampling error. Right. So the first explanation I'm giving here is so that we can make a reasonable assessment of what we expect to be true about the population. But really like what I'm trying to get at here is if we acknowledge that the sampling error exists, which we, we have to do because we're using only a subset of the total amount of information that exists in our population of interest, we need to be able to account for this error. If we ignore it, we could give the wrong conclusion. And you know the results of that, depending on the situation, could be catastrophic. But if we acknowledge that it exists and we can um, determine how we, and it, if we acknowledge that it exists and we understand how the population behaves, then we can make very reasonable descriptions of the sampling error and account for it in our analysis. And what's interesting is a lot of the tests that we're going to learn about early on in the course, they actually are kind of designed to account for this error naturally. And we'll see examples of this once we get into lecture set two and lecture set three, and we actually look at confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. But for now, the key points that I'm trying to kind of refresh you on are that the error, the sampling error exists. And it exists because of how we are going to go about conducting inference. So we have a population of interest. We take a small portion of the population and we use that small portion to um, make a statement about the larger population. So the error has to exist naturally because of that setup. The second part of this is <clears throat> if we assume that the population follows some statistical distribution. So let's say that the population is normal. Then any of the statistics that are taken from the samples that we can collect from that population will also follow a distribution, a, a statistical distribution. Therefore, if we actually are able to make a reasonable assessment of the distribution of the population, we can also make a reasonable assessment of the distribution of our estimators or the statistics that we are going to work with. Through those assessments, we can easily describe the sampling error. Now, in the case of the sample mean, which is sort of the statistics that the statistic that we always kind of turn to in these illustrations, 
mainly because it has a lot of nice properties. We can describe the distribution of the sample mean using um, some fairly straightforward formula. So for example, when we are using the sample mean to estimate a population mean, the distribution of the sample mean will always have a mean that's equal to the population mean, and it'll always have a standard deviation that is equal to sigma over the square root of n. Okay, so mu x bar and sigma x bar, which are shown in point number four, those are the mean and standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Okay, and they are equal to the population mean and sigma over square root of n, respectively. Okay. <coughs> now, these formula can be used to describe the sampling error. And the question on at the end of slide 14 asks, what happens to the standard deviation of the sample mean as the sample size gets larger? Okay, well, notice here that as n gets larger, sigma over the square root of n will get smaller. Therefore, sigma x bar, which is equal to sigma over the square root of n will get smaller as n increases. All right, so what is the purpose of this point? Basically, the purpose of this point is to re-emphasize something that we would already know to be true. The more information we collect, the better our estimate is going to be. It is true from this description that as n gets larger, the standard deviation around the sample mean gets smaller. So basically what that's telling us is that our estimate is going to get more precise as we increase the sample size. And this is something that we would expect to be true because if we increase sample size, it means that you're taking a bigger portion of the population in your sample. And the bigger the portion of the population that you collect, the more act or the more precise your estimate is going to be. All right. So the sampling distributions, which refer to the distributions of the statistics that we are, or of the estimators that we are using, can also be used to describe the sampling error. And in particular, the standard deviation of the estimators is, are going to typically reveal that the more information you collect, the more precise your estimate is gonna be. <clears throat> All right. A lot of the time in this class, we are going to make the assumption that our populations are normally distributed. And in this course, we will study this assumption in depth. So we will talk about different ways that we can test and evaluate this assumption. If the population is normal, then X bar, the sample mean, will also be normal. So this is a very nice property of normality. It's basically telling us that if we start from a normal distribution, our sample mean will also be normal. All right. <clears throat> On the previous slide, we defined the mean and the standard deviation, or sorry, we defined the mean and the standard deviation of the sample mean. So we defined mu x bar and sigma x bar. On, in point three, we are saying in a shorthand notation, if X is normally distributed with mu and sigma squared as its mean and variance, then X bar will be normally distributed with mu and sigma squared over N as its variance. So you can see that those two formula are being utilized within the normal distribution 
of X bar. So regardless of the distribution of interest, uh, regardless of the distribution of the population, mu x bar is always mu and sigma x bar is always sigma over the square root of n. But if the population is normal, then those values parameterize a normal distribution. And we can visualize what that means in the context of increasing sample size, basically just by generating observations from some hypothetical distribution. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's assume that X is normally distributed with a mean of 70 and a variance of 100. And then let's collect samples of different sizes and compute the sample mean for those different samples. Right. So on slide 16, we have the results of this experiment. So here we can see the population. Okay, so this is a normal distribution with a mean of 70 and a standard deviation of 10. This is the sampling distribution of X bar when N equals two. Okay, so you can see that it's centered at the same point, right? So the mean is roughly 70. And then we have an illustration of the spread around the mean, which is fairly large in this case. Okay, so here we have the same illustration And then here we have the same illustration, but the only difference is that we're increasing sample size. Right. So in all three cases, our sampling distributions are centered at the same point. But as our sample size increases, you can see that the histogram is getting tighter to the mean, which is implying that the standard deviation is decreasing. So what this is showing us is a visual representation of how the sampling error decreases with the increasing sample size, right? So the more, inf basically the more you know. So the more information you collect, the more confident you can be about your result. And in the case that we start from a population that's normal, as long, as in the case that we start from a population that's normal, our sampling distributions will always be normal. So we have a very easy way of describing the sampling error and describing the distribution of our sample mean based off of the fact that we started from normality. All right, now this next part is just about what it means to be normal. So one of the questions on assignment one is basically asking you to describe what normality means um, in some detail and then give an example. <laughs> All right. So here we have um, basically like what this question is asking you is what does it mean for something to be normal? Right. And then to give an example of a variable that might be normally distributed and then what that would mean in the context of that particular variable. But if something is normal, it's going to adhere to some very similar properties. Right. So one. The distribution. Will. Always. Have a bell curve shaped um, density curve. Yeah. Or you can also say like the, the variable will always follow a bell curve. So we saw an example of this on the previous slide because in all four situations that we were looking at, we were changing the standard deviation, but the shape of the distribution never changed. So in all four situations, the shape was a bell curve. Okay. 
two. The distribution will always follow the empirical rule. Okay, so this is something you'll have to review. So if we have normally distributed populations, <clears throat> they'll always have a bell curve structure or their density curves will always be a bell curve. So the values will always follow that bell curve. And the distribution will always follow the empirical rule for bell curves. Okay, so regardless of the parameter set, you're always going to have distributions that follow this empirical rule and have a bell curve like shape. Right. Um, three, we could say as standard deviation for variance increases the um i guess the width if you will the width of bell curve decreases. And then again, we could see this on the previous slide. On the previous slide, we noticed that as the sample size was getting larger, the width of the bell curve was getting smaller. So everything was getting tighter to the mean. Um, as sample size increases, the standard deviation of the sample mean is going to decrease. So this is a representation of that fact. Okay. So these are a few different points that we can make about distributions that are normally uh, that follow a normal or sorry, these are a few points that we can make about normal distributions. So on the assignment, one of the questions is asking you to describe what it means for something to be normal and then give an example of this. So hopefully these points will help just to kind of jog your memory on that. But the idea here is just to basically state some facts about what it means when a variable is normal and then come up with a reasonable example and use that example to highlight what you would know about that population, given that it is normal. Okay. Um, okay, so I will stop here for today. And then on Tuesday next week, we'll finish lecture set one and start lecture set two. All right, so you have um, the first assignment uh, given to you. And again, that's due next Friday. And um, we have, uh, please let me know if you're interested in taking part in those mini group projects so I can set that up uh, and start sending out the information for those. And um, labs start next week. So there's no labs this week. They start uh, next week. You'll have one lab a week for each class. And I have office hours tomorrow at 10, but I'll send a reminder of that. So have a good weekend. And I will talk to you guys on um, next Tuesday if I don't hear from you before. <laughs>